Well, are you ready for the word here tonight? Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Stretch your hands up toward heaven, if you will. Father, we lift our hands before you in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. We want to thank you, Father God, for showing us wonderful things from your word this evening. Lord, teach us by your spirit. And uh, Lord, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen, amen. Praise God. Turn to someone before you see it and tell them you're in the right place tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's see if we can get this going. I think we got it going all right. Hallelujah. All right. Well, the next uh, three services, we're going to uh, talk about uh, uh, the things of the Spirit. But uh, I want to talk to you uh, primarily, specifically, about the book of Acts. I want to look at keys to the book of Acts. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Uh, you know, there have been many church models through the years. And uh, men have come and said, this is how we ought to have church. Yeah. This is all how we ought to do church. But the Bible has given us the, the prime example of how church ought to be in our lives. Amen? I mean, you've got different models. You've got uh, uh, different church growth models. You've got seeker-sensitive churches, and you've got uh, uh, churches that, uh, uh, that'll draw a multitude of people, but uh, there's one thing lacking. Power. God wants us to have power in our midst. And if there's anything that describes uh, the church in the book of Acts, it's the power of God in manifestation. And uh, one of the great keys to uh, the book of Acts is the command that Jesus gave his disciples in, uh, in the early part of the chapter. In chapter 1, I, I, I just want to read this. Um, in chapter 1... Um, the Bible tells us in verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them. I want you to notice that this is a command to the church. Uh, you know, a lot of people think uh, when it comes to the baptism in the Holy Spirit that, uh, well, that's what the Pentecostals do. That's what the Charismatics have. Uh, that's, uh, that's just for the, uh, uh, you know, full gospel folks, you know, uh, the tongue talkers, you know. They, they might just set us apart from the rest of the body of Christ. But I want, I, I want you to understand church that this command is to all the church it's for the Baptists and the Methodists and the Presbyterians it's for the Catholics and the Episcopalians it's for whosoever will and whosoever will come and obey this command that Jesus gave he, he didn't give tongues just to the Pentecostals or to the Assembly of God or the Church of God he just didn't give uh, uh, these gifts of the Spirit to a particular part of the body of Christ. He gave it to all the body of Christ. Amen. And, and if they'll ever wake up and begin to read these portions of Scripture that they're skipping over, then they can get the same Holy Ghost you and I have. They can have the same experience you and I have. And it says here that he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And of course we know that this is one of the great keys 
to the book of Acts is the fact that the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church. Amen? Uh, just about 100 years ago, uh, a little over, uh, John G. Lake, uh, an early Pentecostal pioneer, in fact, you can see his picture uh, with some of the Azusa Street preachers, alongside Daddy Seymour and F.F. F. Bosworth and, and uh, some uh, men that were... Uh, there at the get-go when the Spirit of God was poured out in these last days. And uh, Lake was filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, received that experience with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, and God led him to go to South Africa as a missionary. And uh, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, John Lake, in five years' time, established more than 500 churches, of which those churches, many of them, are still thriving and alive and, and, uh, and uh, doing good things today. So it's an amazing thing that he, uh, uh, what he accomplished. And we could say in, in, uh, in the truest sense, uh, John Lake was, was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Uh, maybe not in the sense that the 12 apostles of the Lamb were apostles. There's only 12, you know, that, that spent time with Jesus, that uh, observed and, and were uh, eyewitnesses of his ministry. But that doesn't mean uh, there weren't other apostles in the New Testament. There were. Uh, there's a long list. If you do a, a study of the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, you see there are numbers of apostles back at that time. And what is an apostle? It essentially is a, a sent one. Amen? You know, we could say it this way, uh, nearly every, every missionary, uh, every, uh, uh, every apostle is a missionary in some sense, sent by God, but not every missionary is necessarily an apostle. Amen? There's a lot of people that go and have all kinds of positions uh, uh, and do a lot of things, but that doesn't necessarily make them uh, an apostle in the sense of the, of the New Testament. But John Lake was a genuine apostle of God. And uh, one evening he uh, was living in Portland, Oregon. He'd come back to the States and he'd established a work in, in the northwestern part of the nation of the United States, and at one time, uh, that portion of America was considered the healthiest uh, section of America because of Lake's healing homes. He, held, he had healing homes where he would take time to minister to the sick. Amen? And just, just drill the word of God into them on healing. Amen? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, and I, I uh, you know, pastor mentioned it. It seemed like there was a teaching phase in the church. And I mean, we're so hungry for the word in the, uh, the mid-70s and the 80s. And, and you just couldn't get enough. I mean, it was nothing for, you know, a guy like Norval Hayes to preach, uh, uh, preach a couple hours, you know. Brother Hagin, you know, he would preach for an hour, have an altar call for salvation. Then he'd preach another hour on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Have an altar call for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Then he'd preach a third hour on healing and have uh, an altar call for healing. And people just sat through the whole thing, just, just getting soaked with the Word of God. And uh, really, uh, if we want to experience the kind of healing that the Bible provides for us, there has to be a a mind renewal that takes place. And, and to the point, now listen to me, to the point that our whole lives are transformed. See, what concerns me about a lot of these 20-minute services where you're in, you have, uh, you, you know, uh, worship, you, you receive the offering, you receive communion, you know, they, they have, uh, I mean, it's like uh, 
man, automation. They, you know, the church is a thousands of people, and they, they can give everyone communion at, and and get you all out in 25 minutes. And uh, but what concerns me is our lives being transformed. You know, there has to be a mind change. There has to be a mind renewal that takes place in your life to the point that your whole life is transformed. And uh, my question is, are we, are we keeping people under the word of God long enough so that they come to a place of life transformation? And that's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. Can you say amen? So, Lake, an early Pentecostal pioneer, ministered uh, in the healing rooms. He was a disciple of Alexander Dowie. And, and if you don't uh, really look into these men's lives, nearly every one of these men have black marks on their life uh, because the devil tripped them up somewhere along the line, gave them some... Uh, gave him some problems. I'm talking about Alexander Dowie, you know, and had some issues. But I'm telling you, he led the way and he paved the way for divine healing in America. And we need to respect him for that. And uh, there are other men uh, that were controversial in their day. We were talking about William Booth, uh, at uh, the, the founder of the Salvation Army. Uh, in his day, he he uh, uh, he assured that no no. Uh, <laughs> No preacher worth his salt would have him in to preach in his church because uh, of the controversy that surrounded his life. But yet he saw, he saw thousands and thousands of people saved and delivered under his ministry. He went to people that nobody else would go to. And uh, any, any minister and ministry that's uh, worth his salt uh, is going to find a cross at the end of the trail with people... Uh, only too ready to crucify him. So don't don't take it. Uh, uh, you know when someone comes along and says, "Well, you know this about this guy, and you know this about this guy," uh, take it with a grain of salt. You know the Bible says, uh, "Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established." And and he said we shouldn't even receive an accusation against an elder unless uh, unless there's two or three witnesses. So. So, uh, but there's great men of God that went through a lot of controversy. And I tell you, the early days of Pentecost, you know what really concerns me today, folks, is some of these men bled and died to bring this message to us. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, F.F. F. Bosworth, anybody read his little book, Christ the Healer? Uh, still a great textbook in many Bible schools. But uh, <clears throat> at one time, he was beaten with wooden oars until he couldn't walk. And he just, you know, he was laid up for a while, and he went back to preaching. A lot of people with, uh, with this Pentecostal message, uh, they bore the brunt of it. They, paid, they paved the way for you and I, and it, it disturbs me greatly that so many in the church have backed off from the truth, that, from what they know to be true. We're not preaching it openly in the pulpit. We're not demonstrating it openly in the pulpit. We're, we're not uh, offering it to the people because of the fear of man. And because we're afraid that people are, are uh, 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 you know, they're not going to receive it. You know, it's going to be too much. But uh, listen, God wants us to preach the whole council. Amen? And deliver the whole council. Uh, because that's where the power is. You know, there's a lot of churches, there are a lot of, and Paul dealt with it in his day. This is nothing new. He said there are those that have the form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. And see, you know, people, uh, there's enough Bible preached in church churches to say, well, you know, uh, my church is preaching the same Bible your church is preaching. You know what the difference is? The difference is power. The difference is, are you preaching it long and hard and heavy enough to produce some power? God wants to produce power 
in our midst. Not having just a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. Amen. Power to change lives. Power to transform lives. But about a hundred years ago, Lake was walking outside of his home and in the distance, several, you know, just a, a, a few, few yards up the path from him, he saw a light and he began to walk towards this light. And uh, as he came closer, he saw that it wasn't just a light, it was an angel. And the angel uh, came up to him, began to talk to him about several things. Now, Lake uh, was an apostle of God. And so the angel began to talk to him about things going on around the world. Now, one thing about the Holy Ghost, when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, uh, God does something to your vision. It's no longer just about you and your wife and your two children, us four, no more. It becomes bigger than that. Jesus, in, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, told his disciples, he said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and to the uttermost part of the earth. One thing the Holy Ghost will do for you if you get genuinely filled to the full with the Holy Ghost is he's going to give you a vision for the world. Amen? Not to neglect what's going on at home, but he wants us to reach out into the highways and the byways. He wants us to go to the other side of the track. You know, Jerusalem, Judea, the larger region, region Samaria, the other, other side of the track, uh, the area, uh, the, the people that nobody else wants to minister to, and then to the uttermost part of the earth. So the angel began to talk to him about what was happening in China. We ought to be interested about what's happening in China. You know why? Because it's the same body that you and I are part of. Those are our brothers and sisters. He began to talk to him about Russia and how the people were responding to the gospel in Russia. And then again in South Africa where he had given so much of his life. And India. And then in the region of the Middle East, at that time it was Palestine. And then after that he began to talk to him about America and what God was doing in America and how they were responding, uh, how the church was responding to God. And he began to speak to him about the church at Portland. And he said, to my amazement, on approaching the building, high in the atmosphere, a half a mile or more, I discerned millions of demons organized as a modern army. There were those who apparently acted as shock troops. They would charge with great ferocity. There were also, uh, there were those who apparently acted as shock troops. They would charge with great ferocity, followed by a wave and yet another wave and yet another wave. And after a while I observed there operated a restraining influence that constituted a barrier through which they could not force themselves. With all the ingenuity of humans at war, this multitude of demons seemed to endeavor to break the barrier or to go further, but they were utter, utterly restrained. In amazement, I said to the angel, what does it mean? He said to me, such is the care of God for those that strive in unselfishness for his best. I want you to think about that for a moment. An array of demons arrayed against John Lake's church. But the angels said they could go, even though they were organized just like a human army. I mean, just sending wave after wave uh, of uh, demonic troops. Yet, they couldn't go any further. They couldn't break through. 
And this is the reason the angel gave. Uh, they couldn't break through those who strove in unselfishness for his best. God sees your sacrifice. And God rewards your sacrifice. He says, I discerned the heart of the angel was overburdened. In answer to this, the angel said, human selfishness. And human pride have consumed and dissipated the very glory and heavenly power. You know, we cry out for we, we cry out for revival. I mean, churches across this nation, you know, in their prayer meetings, the ones that are praying, they're praying for revival. They're praying for a move of the Spirit. They're praying for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And we wonder sometimes, what's the hindrance? I'll tell you right now, it's not God. God wants to pour his spirit out. What's he dealing with? He's de dealing with hard hearts, with selfish hearts, with people that are out for their own benefit, trying to fulfill their own agenda. God's looking for a group of people that will approach him and his word and his work with a genuine unselfishness. Amen? Amen? If any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. As a young man in high school, I used to think, when I got a revelation of the truth of God's word, I used to lay in my bed at night thinking, what would it be like just to fulfill that scripture? If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What can God do with one unselfish heart? What can God work with one unselfish heart? Human selfishness and human pride have consumed and dissipated the very glory and heavenly power that God once gave from heaven to this movement as you have beheld tonight. We were now at the foot of the pathway again. He took a step or two away, and in a sort of despair, my heart cried out, Angel, these are struggling for want of an ideal. What constitutes real Pentecost? What ideal should be held before the minds of men as the will of God exhibited through a movement like this? In other words, Lake was crying out for a vision. Lord, give us a vision of what you want. What, what, is, the, what is the pinnacle? What is the ideal? What, what, what's the pattern that we're to follow? During all this time, I'd carried my Bible in my hand, reaching for the Bible. He opened to the book of Acts. He ran his finger down over the second page, that portion where the Spirit of God came down from heaven, proceeding through the book of Acts to its great outstanding revelations and phenomena. And he said, this is Pentecost as God gave it through the heart of Jesus. Strive for this. Contend for this. Teach the people to pray for this. For this, and this alone, will meet the necessity of the human heart, and this alone will have the power to overcome the forces of darkness. When the angel was departing, he said, pray. 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 Teach the people to pray. Prayer, and prayer alone, much prayer, Persistent prayer is the door of entrance into the heart of God. Amen. Now, we're going to look at probably Sunday evening, we're going to look at the place prayer has uh, in the book of Acts and uh, emphasize that. But, but really, when we talk about keys to the book of Acts, the, if you want one key above every other key, it is, it is prayer. Prayer is the key 
to the book of Acts. It's really, uh, it's really a series of prayer, meeting, prayer meetings and their eventual answer. And you see that from Acts chapter 1 all the way up through Acts 28. But, uh, so we're going to look at that uh, uh, tomorrow evening in a little more depth. But, uh, but the three keys beyond prayer that I want to look at in the next three services is tonight we're going to look at uh, the first key to the book of Acts and seeing it established and, and working in our lives is the word of God. We're going to look at that. Tomorrow morning, we're going to look at uh, the Holy Ghost. It's the second key. And Sunday night, we're going to look at the third key, which is the name of Jesus. And I'm going to tie prayer. I thought about bringing in prayer tonight, but really uh, uh, prayer just goes hand in hand with the name of Jesus. So we're going to look at both those things in depth on Sunday night. But uh, this, uh, this evening, I want us to talk about the place that the scriptures have in our lives to see the book of Acts come about. Amen? The Bible uh, tells us when Jesus was being tempted in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4, he responded to the devil. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. One thing we know about the scripture, the word of God, is it's God's voice written down. If you want to get familiar with his voice, read the, read the word of God. Read the scripture. Amen? Now, uh, I can give you some good arguments for, for the King James Version. It's a good, uh, it's a good thing. But, but the most important thing is you get exposed to scripture. You get exposed to the word. If you have a translation you enjoy, read it until you get tired of it and read another one. But keep that, uh, keep the word of God coming in because the more you, <coughs> the more you become familiar with the scripture, the more you're going to become, uh, you're going to become familiar with the voice of God. Amen. Because this is how we live, by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Psalm 119, he says to us, uh, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. Amen. The word of God will defeat sin in our lives. Amen. Jesus is the living word. The angel appeared to Joseph and he said, She shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Amen? It is God's word that he confirms in the earth. With his word in your life, with his word in your heart, the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 16, and they went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Uh, the, the devil's very subtle. And there's a lot of things that people get off track on and preach a lot of different things and a lot of different ideas and a lot of different philosophies. But there's only one thing in this life that God confirms and that is his word. If you will preach his word, if you will study his word, if you will determine to get his word in your heart, God will show up in mighty power. Can you say amen? He doesn't confirm you necessarily. I mean, there are people that have been, you know, I mean, they'll live in sin all week long, get up behind the pulpit on Sunday morning and repent, and God will show, uh, he, he'll show up like, uh, like wildfire. Because he's not confirming that man's life, he's confirming the word that he's preaching. I don't condone that, and don't necessarily agree with that, because eventually, 
the word of God will expose a life like that. But the fact of the matter is uh, that God confirms the scripture. Can you say amen? amen. Praise God. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you have to look beyond the flesh to look to the gift that's in a man. Are you listening to me? Sometimes you have to look, uh, uh, look beyond the foibles and the failures and the shortcomings of a man's flesh because he's preaching the word of God. God does not confirm this flesh. He doesn't confirm the 6 o'clock news. He doesn't confirm U.S. News and World Report. God confirms his word. And if we'll preach his word and believe his word, he'll back up the preaching of the word. Amen? In Bible school, Kenneth Hagin had said this, but uh, I was in a church service up in Michigan, and a man asked me a question, a man that had preached in 60 nations around the world, a man that some people referred to him as the father of the Jesus movement. Because in the early days, in the late 50s and 60s, and all through the 60s, he preached in uh, Southern California on the universities. And... Uh, uh, preached, uh, preached the word from Genesis to Revelation. And in that time when he began, there were no Christian organizations on those college campuses. After he was done, there was more on, on USC alone, University of Southern California, there were 11 Christian organizations that had started up because of this man's preaches. He influenced students, he influenced college professors, and uh, he went on to preach on into the, uh, into the 90s, and uh, then the Lord took him home. He preached from the 30s to the 90s. But he asked me this question. He said, how does revival come? And my answer was prayer. He said, no, revival does not come by prayer. I said, well, revival is uh, a sovereign move of the Spirit. You know, God just shows up and he pours out his Spirit, and uh, that's how revival comes. He gave me a great key that day. Now, I'd heard, I'd heard others say it. Kenneth Hagin had said it. And uh, when this man said it, I knew there was something different about him because he had experienced it all through his life. And this is what he said. He said, revival comes by the preaching of the word of God. So how are we going to fill these seats in this place? I tell someone, someone tells someone else, someone tells someone else. I tell you, when we start preaching the word of God, not just letting the preacher preach, but when we start preaching it to our neighbors, to our friends, to our co-workers, to uh, to the grocery store worker, to when we start ministering to people and sharing the good news of the gospel, that's what's going to bring revival. Are you listening to me? There's no other, there's no other key. There's no other way. Uh, certainly God has to get that word out, but uh, our job is just to keep preaching it. You don't know, you don't know what an impact, what effect you might have by simply sharing the simple gospel message. I don't know if any of you ever heard of uh, 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 what they called, who they called the George Street Preacher down in Australia. He began to preach and hand out uh, little flyers and tracts, and he did it for about 20 years. And a couple of weeks before his home going, before he went to, uh, went to heaven, and he had been doing this, you know, uh, every day, you know, he'd go out and he, he determined to talk to at least 10 people. And he'd say something like this. He'd say, excuse me, sir, but if you were to die tonight, do you know whether you'd go to heaven or hell? And uh, some people took his literature. Some people threw it up. Some people just, you know, were upset at him. But through the years, he found out that... Uh, uh, another preacher had, had begun to hear about this George Street preacher. 
And he heard about them in Australia. He heard about them in America. He heard about them in India. He heard about them in Japan. He found out that this man, through this witness, had literally impacted people around the world. Just simply sharing the gospel one to another. So, you know, sometimes we may not be aware of the revival that's taking place after we've shared the word. You know, the fellow that uh, witnessed to Billy Graham uh, had no idea where he would take it. Are you listening to me? Revival comes by the preaching of the word of God. We see this throughout the book of Acts. <clears throat> and I'm just going to share some scripture with you here. Uh, but I want you to take note that it's the word of God that makes a difference in our lives. It's, a word of, it's the word of God, it's the gospel that's going to make a difference in the lives of others as well. We see from Acts chapter 2, Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In Acts chapter 4, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. In Acts chapter 6, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. We see that the, the apostles, the leaders of the church, spent time meditating in the scripture. Can you say amen? amen? In Acts 6 and verse 7, after this was done, the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, there, uh, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Amen. You know, we ought to let preachers preach the word. We ought to insist that our pastor has time to meditate in the word and prepare in the word of God. A friend of mine, an older gentleman, uh, Ron Smith, he was a, an associate pastor with uh, mom and dad Goodwin in, uh, in Texas. He had a church when he pastored uh, a woman that attended his congregation pulled up one day. He was working outside the church and cutting some weeds down and mowing some grass. And, and she said, uh, oh, that couldn't be my pastor out there doing all that work. He says, my pastor should be in studying the Bible and praying and preparing uh, for the message. That woman happened to be John Hagee's mother. Amen. Well, she must have got a, she must have, uh, she, she must have uh, made that impression on John because uh, John built a church of thousands by preaching the word. Amen. Spending time studying and preparing. We go on here and we see they went everywhere preaching the word in Acts chapter 10. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he's Lord of all. Acts 10, 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. You know, uh, I, I enjoy a good preacher. And every once in a while, you know, the preach will get on me strong. And I enjoy that. But, but uh, we need the Word of God in any way, shape, or form. Amen? We need to sit under it. We need to hear it. We need to receive it. We need to benefit from it. In Acts chapter uh, 12 and 24, but the Word of God grew and multiplied. In Acts chapter 13, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Acts 13 and 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were deigned to eternal life believed. In Acts 14 and verse 3, long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Acts 14, 25, And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went into Italia. And Acts 15, 
35, Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. Amen? With many others also. In Acts 16, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord to all them that were in his house. In Acts 17 and 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. In Acts 17 and 13, but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. In Acts 18 and 11, he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. In Acts 19 and verse 10, and this continued by the space of two years, so that all which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. In Acts 19, and so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. In Acts 20 and 32, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. Amen? We see all through the book of Acts that they preached the word of God. Now, what, what is unique about his word? Really, the, the primary thing about the scripture, about the word of God, that causes it to stand out and stand alone from everything else is the fact that the Bible is the truth. Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Throughout the book of Acts, they preached truth. And I don't know about you, but you were created in the image of God. I was created in the image of God. Uh, uh, you are made in his image, and he is a God of truth. The Bible tells us that God cannot tell a lie. He's all about the truth. And when truth comes to us, it will ring a bell in our spirits. And if you are a friend of truth, if you have an affinity for the truth, you'll be drawn to the truth. If you are about lies, if you are hooked up with the enemy and with Satan, uh, you, you will have a repulsion to the truth. But, but one way or another, you are going to respond to truth when it's preached. The one thing we have in the church, the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, is the final and last bastion and fort for the truth. We hold forth the truth in a world full of lies. There was recently a man from one government organization. He was talking about what they were doing, what they were involved in. And, and uh, the reporter was talking to him. And he said, uh, you've told a lot of lies, haven't you? He said, he said, no, 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 let me correct that. It's not that we lied about some things. We lied about everything. I won't mention the organization, but that's, uh, that's what one of the fellows that worked for the organization said. We lied about everything. The Bible says in Psalm 119, Therefore I esteem thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. The one thing that will set us apart in this earth is that we are beacons of the truth. We are bearers of the truth. The church is the holder and the great steward of truth in the earth. You can't send your kids to public school today and expect them to learn the truth. You can't expect them. You cannot send them to the university and expect the universities to teach them the truth. In fact, the truth that they think they know, they're going to change it in 10 years' time. You know, I'll give you a good example. It used to be psychologists, scientists, doctors all agreed on this. That a man is a man because he has a man's equipment. A woman is a woman because she has a woman's equipment. But you know what they're telling us now? now I'm not talking about people on the street. 
I'm not talking about a certain segment of society. I'm talking about our teachers, our professors, our doctors, our scientists are now telling us that sexual orientation has nothing to do with physicality, but has everything to do with mentality. So that means if you think you're a woman, whether you got the physical ability and traits of a man, you're a woman. That's what science is teaching us. And let me tell you, friends, it's a pack of lies. It's a pack of lies. Now, it's, it's so strong in some areas of the world, I would be arrested for, just, for what I just said. But the fact of the matter is, truth has always been truth, and it'll always be truth, and it doesn't change from decade to decade. God told us the truth. And a lot of what we're basing our lives on has nothing to do with truth. We're sending our children to school and filling them with lies. We're sending our children to the universities. We're sending our, our, our educated people to university that's not teaching them anything about what truth is, but filling their heads with lies to the point we don't know what's true and what's error. But I'll tell you this, let God be true and every man a liar. Sanctify them by our truth. You know what sanctify means? It means to set apart, to separate, to set aside for a holy purpose. And you know what truth will do to you? It will make you different from everybody that's around you. It will make you unique. It will make you different. Are you listening to me? I'll tell you why the church is not impacting society is because we're not preaching the truth with boldness. We give you a little bit of truth and we add a whole lot of error with it. And the fact of the matter is, folks, we need the truth in its purest form. God's word is truth. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. I esteem thy word concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. You know, we based a lot of our society and a lot of things we do, you know, Hitler exterminated millions of people based on the writings of a woman named Agnes San uh, Sangford, the, the, uh, the, uh, she was the founder of, uh, of uh, Planned Parenthood, which targets poor urban areas and eliminates those people. And she got her information from a man named Charles Darwin and based a lot of her philosophy and a lot of her thinking on survival of the fittest. In other words, let's get rid of the weak in our society and we'll have nothing left but the ruling, uh, ruling elite. Hitler read a lot of her material. And he thought, well, that makes sense, so he's just going to kill off what he considered to be the weak. Stalin the same way. He killed more people than Hitler did based on Darwin's theory of evolution. And it's all based on a lie. In earth science in 1973 in junior high school, they told me that in 30 years there wouldn't be enough food on the earth to, to uh, sustain the population. There wouldn't be enough area, land area, to sustain the population in 30 years, which, by the way, would be about 2003. They said from 73 to 2003, the population is going to grow so fast and so large that we're not going to be able to handle any of it. 
And so they told us back in 1973, they said, uh, well, we're going to have to start living in outer space. We're going to have to start living under the sea. We're going to have to start eating kelp and seaweed, uh, you know, because the earth won't be able to produce enough. You know, the fact of the matter is, folks, one, uh, in one half the city limits of Jacksonville, Florida, you can stand the entire world's population shoulder to shoulder. You can give everyone in the world a, a nice quarter acre lot in the state of Texas. If you could, uh, if you could get uh, uh, Kansas to feed Nebraska, Nebraska produces enough, uh, uh, enough harvest to feed the entire world. And we've been told, we, we've been told all kinds of things. You know, back in the, the mid-70s, you know what the big concern was among scientists? Global cooling. That's right, the ice age. We're going to have another ice age. Now they're saying the exact opposite. Whatever happened to the ice age? I'm telling you, they don't know what they're talking about. Now, I can't say I understand all the science behind everything. I, I, you know, I, I believe he that seeks the Lord understands all things, so I'm learning and I'm growing. All I know is this. I esteem God's word to be true. Now, knowing that, I may not fully comprehend it in my head, but if the Bible says one thing and science says another, I'm going with the Bible. If the Bible says one thing and, and the universities say another, my high school says another, society, the 6 o'clock news, says something different, I'm going with the Bible. You know, a lot, of the, a lot of things we think is a fact has no basis in truth at all. Are you listening to me? Amen. 500 years ago, a man got some math together and figured out mathematically the sun has to be millions of miles from the earth. It is spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. Now listen to me. Hold on to me. Don't, don't tar and feather me yet. Spinning a thousand miles an hour, it's going around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour. It's traveling in our universe at 660,000 miles an hour, and the whole thing is moving away from the Big Bang at a million miles an hour. And do you know, they still have yet to prove that the earth is moving at all. There has never been one scientific experiment that's shown that the earth is spinning at all. Now, I'm not here to say whether it is or it isn't. I'm just here to tell you it's still the Copernican theory. It's theory. And a theory is a supposition based upon ignorance of the subject. And because of the Copernican theory, we had millions of miles and millions of years because it's light years that it takes light to travel. And they never answer the simplest question that a sixth, uh, a sixth grader ought to be asking is, how does, how does light and heat travel through a vacuum anyway in the vacuum of space? But because of Copernicus, 500 years ago, along came a man named... Darwin, who came up with millions of years and millions of miles, and his theory does not work unless you have Copernicus. And then you've got, and now we don't teach Copernicus as a theory, we teach it as fact. Now, I can't stand up here and tell you that I know for sure the earth is not spinning, but I'll tell you there's a multitude, not just one or two, but there's a multitude of scientists physicists, college professors that see the opposite view. That instead of living in a heliocentric universe where the sun is the center, by the way, Copernicus was a sun worshiper, instead of the sun being at the center, they believe there's a, there's a number of people that believe that the earth, it, that it's a geocentric universe. Now, right or wrong, 
Einstein himself said, we have no way of knowing from our perspective whether the earth is traveling around the sun or whether the sun is traveling around the earth. There is no way that we know this, and, and there's never been an experiment to show it. Now, they can show it with math, but math can do funny things. You can, you can prove a lot of things that aren't true by a mathematical formula or postulate. So these guys all came along, and a guy came along trying to prove that the earth was moving. Not just one guy. There was a Michelson and Morley, and there was a Michelson and another guy, and then there was a, uh, another guy that did an experiment. They all tried to prove and show that the earth was moving. Not one of them was able to prove it. Every, si every experiment failed. So guess who comes along with another theory? Einstein comes along with the theory of relativity. The reason we can't see anything move is because everything's moving all at the same time and it's relative to everything else, so you can't feel a thing. Just so you know, the Bible never once says the earth is moving, but it says the exact opposite. The Bible says over and over again that the earth is stationary, stable, and unmoving. Now, maybe it's because of the theory of relativity. Theory of relativity says everything is moving. What I just explained, you know, the earth is spinning, we're going around the sun, the sun's moving through the universe, everything's moving in concert with one another so we don't see anything move. Well, they had to somehow come up with an idea so that everything's moving. So that's where the theory of relativity came along. And then later, because of that, a guy came up with the Big Bang Theory. But the only thing I want to leave you with today is I want you to understand this. None of it is truth. None of it is fact. It's all based on conjecture and ideas. There's never been any true science to prove these happenings that we've been fed all our lives. But we know one thing for sure. Whatever the world is saying, whatever science is saying, whatever the universities in your high school and your grade school is saying, let God be true and every man a liar. We are the holders of truth, and with truth, we're going to change the world. Are you listening to me? It is truth that will change the world. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Let's stand to our feet briefly here. Father, we thank you for the living word. I'm so grateful, Father, that you've given us truth that you've 